right. Psalm 111. Psalm 111. So uh, when my wife and I were uh, talking in, um, in undergrad, I was uh, under the, the wisdom from some counsel I received, I need to take it slow, right? This is before I even said it, that I was interested or not. You know, people said, I need to really take it slow. And um, what I said to her and things of that nature, because I wanted to, you know, make sure I guarded her heart. I didn't want to say any words or show her that I was interested too much because I didn't want her, you know, us both to get attached and then end up not being God's will and things of that nature. So I, I was trying to do this thing, this delicate balance of showing her I was interested by asking her to like big events like uh, big, bigger dates. Of one of the things are called artist series at our school, but also being careful with my words about saying things that I wanted to say, but it was not ready because I didn't want to rush things. I wanted to be very sure that this was God's will for our lives before I even said I was interested. That's how you know, serious I was taking even the dating relationship, even before the dating relationship, before I even said I was interested, I wanted to know this was God's will. So I, I was, and I saw, you know, part of the, it was good advice to take the dating relationship seriously, not just, you know, breaking people's heart left and right, so, right? Um, but what happened was, is that there would, especially early on, there were some awkward times. So like I said, there was this delicate balance of me trying to keep her interested, but I also taking it very slow, not even saying I'm interested, not saying too much compliments and things of that nature. And I remember the first time, you know, I asked her to this, what we call artist series at my university. An artist series was like this big, fancy, bougie event at my university, and people would dress up, and you would get flowers for, the day, for your dates and stuff like that, and you'll see, you know, fancy, bougie things like operas and plays and all this stuff, right? I didn't care about any of that. I just cared about the date. Um, but you would pick the lady up from the dorm, and usually you'd wait down there on the floor, and they would come down the door lobby. And I remember my first, this is my first date. You know, I didn't mention I was interested at all. First, or first, like, uh, this is actually second date, but first, like, this artist series event. So this is big for me, right? And she comes down, and my mind, she was stunningly beautiful. All right? Just stunningly beautiful. She comes down. I was running late, but she was still, she wasn't ready on time, but still. But uh, anyways, but she was studying beautiful coming down. And I remember seeing her. And wanting to say, express what I was feeling on the inside, but I like mirror hearing the wisdom. Don't say anything. Don't say anything too big. You know, might not be God's really going to crush her heart, you know, guard her heart, you know, all the issues of life. All these Bible verses and wisdom start coming to me, right? So she comes down, and I'm like, I say something awkward like, oh, you know, you look nice. Or it's just very subdued or like you don't. You know, it looked that bad or something. It was just something awkward. <laughs> it was just something because I was trying to be careful with my words, but it ended up being like very like subdued and low key. My words did not reflect the reality and beauty and splendor of my soon of my future wife, right? It did not reflect what I wanted to say. It's one thing to not to give your date uh, the fitting compliment that they deserve based on their appearance or whatever. It's another whole thing for God's people who have been beneficiaries of the amazing work of God and graciousness of God not to give rightful and fitting praise to who he is and what he has done. I might need somebody up here. Not, not you, I'm talking about a dog. The reality is that many of us are anemic have an anemic, underwhelming uh, in our praise to God for what he, who, who he is and what he's done. We give, a we give God a bunch of prayer requests, especially when we're going through tough times. The prayer requests are abundant. We might even serve him in varying capacity. But our praise of him is often lacking where it should, uh, should be, both in the amount of praise we give but also in its, our praise, fervency, passion, and priority. And this psalm this morning is a, is, is, a, is a praise psalm celebrating the amazing, mighty, and compassionate works of God towards his covenant people. The psalmist reminds us of his majestic and powerful works and his loving and compassionate acts towards 
his people. And we see the collective passionate praise of God, but, but we also see the natural res uh, the response to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to who he is and what he's done is praise. Praise, and then at the end of the text, fear of him, walking in holy fear of him. And the main thing that we see in our text this morning is that we must passionately, we is an important word. I know sometimes I say we in our opening thematic statement a lot, but we is an important word in this psalm, all right? We must passionately praise and fear our God and his majestic and compassionate works. Uh, for his, sorry, for his uh, majestic and compassionate works. Another thing really quickly about our psalm of praise this morning is that it's a psalm that is, like I said, it's like a, a duo psalm. It comes in a pair. This psalm and the next psalm, 112, are paired together in theme and structure. As you know, the psalms, one of the, uh, one of the aspects of the psalms, you know, their poetry, and one aspect of Hebrew poetry is that some of them, not all, follow like a crest acrostic pattern, and that's the case here. After the initial phrase, praise the Lord, which begins both this psalm and the next psalm. You see the first word of each line. You can't see it in our language, but in the original, the first uh, word of each line begins with the following letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Those of you who are here on Wednesday know that I'm going through Psalm 119. Every section begins with the first letter, uh, the, uh, the next successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And I mentioned that once so you can be aware of the psalm structure, but also it's going to be part of an activity that we do in our afternoon praise service. But our psalm this morning focuses on exalting the great works of God, and Psalm 112 speaks on the, the faithful character and works of God who fear, uh, who, who, who fear uh, this great God who's done all these amazing works. And our last, the last verse, verse 10, is not only a fitting response to the celebration of the works of God and the praise of the works of God, it introduces the next psalm as well. So our psalm today is broken up into three sections. The first one is in verse 1. And we see the psalm expressing thanks and praise to the Lord his God. The psalmist opens and closes this book with the invitation to praise the Lord. And we see first is that we must passionately praise our God together. Look at verse, uh, verse part of verse 1 with me. Praise the Lord. The psalmist gets right to business with expressing the heart of the psalm with this, this phrase. Praise the Lord. Another translation, actually, uh, you know, the, it's, it's the, uh, more in line with the Hebrew word is hallelujah. Short biblical way of saying praise Yahweh or praise Yah is actually a little translation there. Praise the Lord. We need more hallelujah exclaimers in our church. The psalmist was filled with praise and thanksgiving in, in his heart towards the Lord, and it just spilled out in the opening words of the psalm. As children of Yahweh, of the Most High God, we must be people of praise, adoration, thanksgiving to our God. Praise has to our God has to be part of our DNA. We cannot let people who serve dead and false, fake gods out praise and give thanks uh, and worship to a fake God when we serve the true and one living God. Our praise must outnumber the praises of false, fake gods. We serve a living God who has called us his own, and we, uh, you know, we're going to look into his awesome works in a second, but at the outset of the psalmist wants to make it expressly clear that we as his people should be people of praise. If someone examines your life, your Christian life, right, both in this private and public time, would they take away, would a takeaway be that you are a person of praise to your God? Praise and thanksgiving should just flow from, from uh, the people of God. And a couple of things I want to point out about praise and thanksgiving, the psalmist uh, brings to our attention um, uh, before we look at the rest of this psalm, and it's gonna, it should be in our minds that we look at the rest of this psalm, but also they should, it should be essential aspects of our praise and thanksgiving to God. And that is, in this verse, we see that praise to our God should be with our whole heart, with our whole being. That's the first aspect there. Look at the next part of verse 1. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Thanks to Yahweh with your entire being. 
Thanks is uh, the word there is ex it could extol as well, but it's translated uh, thanks, but is a, that is an expression of praise. It should be done with your entire mind, soul, body, mouth. The psalmist did not have to praise. Some of y'all young ones know what it means to have do your room, right? Your, mo your mom says do this, and you kind of half do it. You hide stuff under the bed or something like that. No, no, no. The psalmist did not have to praise. When we give praise and thanksgiving to God, it is with everything we have. Praising our God. It's not half-hearted. Is the praise that you give, is it half-hearted? Is, uh, is, it, is, is it, you know, distracted? Is it self-conscious, worrying about what other people are going to think? Is it lazy? Or does it reflect a heart full of praise to God? Is it with your entire heart? Think about that. As you sing, as you pray, as you give testimony, is your heart and soul engaged in praise and thanksgiving to God, or are you just going through the motions, you're thinking about other people and things of that nature? You know, some people who are, you know, I know that uh, your expression of praise can be a lot of times cultural, but some people who, who have a stoic expression of praise to God, when you catch them at their favorite, if they went to their favorite NFL team or sports team, their praise ain't stoic. Right? They celebrate their sports teams and things that will burn and mean, I love sports, but it means nothing when it comes to eternity, right? And then, but our praise to our God is minimal and passionless and, and stoic. The other aspect of praise the psalmist draws to our attention in this verse, in this case, was praising and thanking God in community. In community. Look at the next part of verse 1. In the company of the upright. Let us talk about people who are living rightly before God. In the congregation, the people of God. So yes, praise should be an individual, uh, individual expression of thanksgiving and praise. In fact, if praise, praising your God, the only time you praise your God is when you come together at church, you're doing it wrong, right? Um, in fact, our collective praise together will be helped and strengthened if you've been spending time individually praising and worshiping your God all week. So some of us need to make sure, and another thing that's going to help our worship time is if you come to church with your heart prepared. I know people have different things going on, different seasons of life, but just sometime in the morning before you get here, uh, thanking the Lord, maybe listen to some Christian music, listen to the verse, and just preparing your heart before you even get here, and that's going to further you know, prepare your heart. Sometimes we come and everybody looks like zombies to start. And it's not until maybe the welcome time that people wake up or they're, you know, and some of that is we need to go to bed on time, get some caffeine and things of that nature. Some of it, we just need, we need to prepare our heart to worship the Lord. And, and so when you walk in here, you're excited about getting to worship our great God together. Whether you're young or old or whatever you are, we get to worship the great God together collectively. And that starts with you individually. But praise here is not just individual. Again, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's collective and covenant community. We must be people of praise and thanksgiving to our God. We as a church, as a covenant body for believers, must be uh, uh, people of passionate, heartfelt praise to our God. Not just on Thanksgiving Sunday, but it should be a testament of our gathering that we are people of wholehearted praise to God. We must remind our, each other through song, through fellowship, through prayers, through testimonies of what our God has done and who he is. People who don't know God, who maybe visit us, right, should come and believe and be blown away by how much we give thanks and praise to our God. Almost so it could make them uncomfortable that, man, all they do is just praise and thank, uh, uh, and thank God. It has always been God's plan that praise, praising him would not just be an individual experience, but in corporate endeavor as well. This psalm and other, there are other psalms, uh, many other psalms and examples of Israel together giving thanks to God, reciting scriptures and praising God together. Again, many of the psalms were written, the choir master was not singing solos to himself, right? They were written 
for corporate public worship. We see a communal aspect of praise clear into, clearer in the New Testament church. Who, we who are ransomed by the blood of Christ worship the Lord uh, on the day that he was re resurrected together. And part of that, uh, that worship service, that gathering, should be bringing praise and thanksgiving to God. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. First Timothy talking about, uh, you know, it, uh, about praying together through preaching and testimony. All of it should be done as a body, whether you're young, you're five, or you're 55. All of us are participating in praising a God in, in multiple ways. Through fellowship, through giving, through singing, through preaching, through teaching, through discipleship, through prayer. And in eternity, God will be magnified by people of every tribe, tongue, and nation of the whole earth throughout the generation, giving perfect praise to our God for the Lamb that was slain for us. So this, this aspect of us all together collectively praising God is an essential part of your Christian walk and experience. God places special value on us as a group as we give praise for who he is and what he's uh, done. There's no such thing. All right, there's some people maybe don't give any individual praise and they just come to church and wait for the collective, but there's a, a, another extreme of just thinking it's just you, yourself, and God, and you just have this individual experience with God, and you don't need the body of Christ. No such thing throughout the Bible, all right? There's no such thing of a, of a healthy biblical Christian just praising God individually and never worshiping God with the body of believers. There's no such thing of this me, myself, and I Christianity who, negate, who neglects the church and Christian community. From Old Testament to Revelation, you see a community of God's people worshiping God and praising God together. If you don't have a local church, a Christian community that you regularly worship with, we welcome you here at this church. You need God's people part of your life and you need to worship together with God's people. That is an essential part of your Christian work. Someone said that this verse both combats the private mysticism of somebody thinking they can just do worship God alone. They end up going through all types of False, uh, false teaching sometimes is going uh, on as an island, but also it counteracts the religious hypocrisy of thinking you can just worship God externally, but not from your heart. So the psalmist moves from the section of just, exp uh, of just expressing the praise and thanksgiving to the Lord to celebrating why he's praising God for his great and wonderful works of God. And the next main section of our psalm, the longest one we see, is we must praise God for his mighty and gracious works. Didn't have time to just bullet point all the, the works that we're going to see highlighted here, but I'm trying to go through this quickly. The Lord's great, verses, look at verses 2 and 3 with me. Or, uh, verse 2. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. The, the Lord's great works should be studied by those who take pleasure in them. Great are the works of the Lord. All the way until verse 9, we see the works of the Lord being described or highlighted. And here the psalmist says the works of the Lord are great. They're, I mean, they're out of the order there. They're remarkable. And they're studied by all who delight in him. I mean, the people of God who take pleasure and benefit from the works of God, they study them. All right, the sense here is actually to seek them out, to ponder, to investigate them. If you have been impacted and blown away by the works of your God, you want to see and study more of it. Listen, you guys know I delight in things like tacos. I just had some yesterday, and wings. And because I delight in them, I seek to find the best taco and wing spots in my area or whatever area I'm in, right, because I delight in them. God's people should delight in the works of the Lord and naturally should seek and study them out. How often do you think and meditate and ponder of the works of the Lord? Now some commentators believe that at this point, because of the word for works there, the psalmist may be stressing the works of creation, his acts of creation. And I think the psalms actually includes more than that here, but... Let's just say, how often do you delight and study the Lord's great works in creation and nature? We must think about this beautiful world he has created. 
A wor- Listen, this world is marred by sin, and yet it's still so beautiful and amazing and a reflection of our great God. When you see the beauty of the fall season, how many like the, the fall season, right? And seeing the, you know, the, uh, the beauty of the, 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 the leaves changing and things of that nature. When you see the sunrise, anybody ever seen a really pretty sunrise or sunset? All of us have, right? We see the mountains and, and beaches and oceans, even the galaxies and stars and planet. We should be in awe of the works of, of our God. Think about all you can see in the diversity of God's creation. No snowflake is the same. All our fingerprints are different and, and just the richness and, uh, of his creation, the magnitude of God's creation. And then think, he spoke it into existence. God spoke complex, massive galaxies, and he spoke and they were created, right? Lands, oceans, animals came from the word of the Lord. Some people who do not know the Lord are so impressed, they are impressed by the created world, but instead of worshiping the creator, they deny that truth and worship the universe. They worship the creation over the creator. You have people who think it's okay to pray to the universe. That's idolatry and leads to death. Two children of God see the works of God in creation and on this earth, and we don't pray to the universe. We praise to God who created it. So whether the psalmist is talking about God's creative works here, we know that we all should delight and ponder in all of God's word. And we're going to look at more of what his, what specifically what those works look like in this text. But we should delight and meditate and praise God for his work of scripture, his work in scripture, the work of the gospel, the work of God's providence, the work of his protection, of his grace, of his love. If there is a desire to see and meditate uh, there should be a desire to see and meditate and ponder of, uh, on the works of your great and awesome God. The great works are like no other. Look at verse 3. They're full of uh, majesty and splendor. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. So God's works are uh, not only beautiful, powerful, and majestic, but they emanate from his righteousness that endures forever. Everything the Lord does, whether his work of creation or his work of providence or his work of grace, is majestic and full of splendor. It's transcendent. There's nothing that can rival the works of God. You think about the ten plagues in, uh, in Exodus, right? You remember that some of the, uh, some of the uh, counselors and wise people of Pharaoh was able to replicate some of the plagues. But even those replications were like pitiful in compared to the real deal. You know, I, as amazing how uh, as iPhones and, gal- and Androids and smart computers and 3D printers and Teslas and all AI and modern technology is, it does not come close to matching the complexity of cre- uh, creation. I know a lot of people freak out about, like, AI taking over the world, artificial intelligence. But scientists say that the closest smart computer is not even close to being as complex as the human brain. It says 86 billion neurons in the human brain, all of which are in use. At the, all of which are in use, all right, and they communicate to one another. Right? This is the glory of your God. Everything God is and does is full of splendor and majesty, and it's an, from an outpouring of His righteousness that lasts forever. That is who your God is, and that is who we collectively praise. God's works is so amazing, that is why the text can say in verse 4, God calls his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. We see that the God, the, see that God is the one who acts in such a way that cause, he causes his works to be remembered. And these works are full of graciousness and mercy or compassion. Most commentators here point out that the psalmist has transitioned to talking about the Lord's works of redemption and provision throughout Israel's history. So the Passover, the Exodus, you know, in the wilderness, you know, one of the, uh, the major redeeming work that the psalmist would, uh, uh, would think about is that of the Exodus and the pa- Passover. God had acted in such a dramatic way on their behalf and powerly, powerfully saving them from Egypt, it was going to be remembered throughout generation as something they would often look back to praise God for. We know that the work, this work of God, any work of God, is an outflow of his graciousness and compassionate character. God's works are not just majestic and transcendent, but they are gracious, 
passionate, and listen, personal. God has not just worked generally in creation, but God who is full of mercy and grace has done works, listen, on your behalf that we must remember. As one commentator points out, God's church, as God's church, we have experienced a greater exodus, a greater pass, a Passover. You know, Jesus is called the, uh, uh, the sacrifice Passover lamb. God sees his bloodshed for us and passes over judgment and gives us his acceptance and embrace. More on that later. Notice the end of verse 3 and verse 4 point out that his works are extensions of his righteousness and his grace, graciousness and mercy. And the point I just want to make here is that everything God does is extension of who he is, right? So when we're praising God for his, for his great works and his works of redemption, his work, the, it, it, we, are, we are praising God for who he is. We can't divorce what Christ, what God does from who he is. It all emanates from his character. Psalmist actually goes into more detail of what these gracious and martial works look like. Look at verse 5, 5, 5. Excuse me. All the young ones, look at verse 5. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembered his covenant forever. People who fear him are people in a covenant relationship with God. They are people in a covenant family relationship with God. Those are people who fear God. Now the fool says in his heart, he, he, there is no God. He does not fool God. But people who are part of God's family fear him and God will provide for them. He remembers his covenant. For young ones, that's a covenant is a serious promise with his people. When you put your faith and trust in Christ, listen, you become a child of God. If you are a child of God, you are part of God's covenant people, and he has a covenant with you, covenants with you, and made promises to you, and he will provide for your needs. The psalmist here praises the God who provides food to those who fear him. And he's thinking back of him provi the God providing, being in the, imagine being in the desert, no food source and no water, and God provides quail and manna from heaven. Imagine this sweet bread from heaven. It's the middle of the desert. You wake up, and there's this really good bread and, and meat, and then they're thirsty, and they have nothing to drink, and God provides water from a rock. Think about that God and praise him. You know, one of the things in this life that we, way, we worry way too much about that Jesus brings out in the Gospels is our clothing and material needs. If you have put your faith in Christ, you are God's child. And listen, y'all, he will provide for you. Some of y'all who are looking for a job, who are hurting financially, you serve a God who's bigger than a bad economy. He will provide for your needs. It's not only part of his covenant with you. It's something that he loves to do. If you like to provide for your kids, how much more will God provide for you? A God who has unlimited resources and money and own a cattle on the thousand here, he does not just have to provide for you. Listen, he wants to. So praise him in advance for his provision before it comes. Some of y'all have been hurting financially before, right? And you can look back and see how God has came through in the past. Praise your God for taking care of your needs uh, uh, before, they, before, before it's even met, because you know that the same God who was faithful in the past will provide for you in the future. Praise God that he's a covenant-keeping God. He keeps his promises, right? Not only to provide for but any promise that he gives you. So his promise to uh, direct you, to guide you, to give you wisdom. He has promised to forgive you, right? And sometimes we, we sin and we sin again and we sin again and we say we got, we're never going to do this and we sin again and we can struggle if God is going to forgive us the next time. No, no, no. God said he is faithful and just to forgive you for all unrighteousness. Any time that you sin, no matter how egregious, no matter how uh, repetitive, if you come to God in, in repentance and forgiveness, guess what? He will always forgive you. Always. Some of y'all need to thank God for his forgiveness. He always keeps his covenant and is always faithful to you. Church, let us praise God for his promises. Some of you, you know, know the pain. How many of you know the pain of someone that you love not keeping their promises? Don't point them out, but I've, I've been there, right? 
Some of you guys know that pain. Good thing that you can praise your God that he is nothing like that. When he said that he would provide, he meant it. When he said that he would never leave you and forsake you, he meant it. When he said that he will always forgive you, he meant it. You can take it to the bank. It is part of his covenant with you. That verse 9 said that has been ordained or uh, forever. Praise him for giving us an eternal inheritance. Look at in the kingdom. Look at verse 6. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the inheritance of the nation. So the psalmist here is talking about the land that they're living in now, which used to be full of wicked, crazy, violent, pagan people. Thank you. And now, it's full of God's people. What happened? Well, God was faithful to fulfill his promise, right? He took an inexperienced, weak nation and cleared, for the most part, a lot of uh, the, the land of the Canaanites. All right? And he still has a promise to fulfill that completely, but they're living in a land with, that used to be filled of, uh, of Canaanites because of God's promise. We can praise God for the gospel work of Jesus in our lives. And yes, he lives in us, but we know that God has given us an eternal inheritance in the new heaven and new health. Yes, God dwells with us, but God does not just redeem our souls. He's making all things new, and we will live in a re resurrected, glorified body in a recreated heaven and earth. Church, we will live in God's perfect place Forever. We, some of y'all, some of y'all, y'all think of heaven, y'all think of like flying ghostly spirits, like immaterial spirits, right? No, no, no. We are going to be in our resurrected bodies in a perfect creation forever. He's creating a new heaven. It's going to be a physical reality that you are going to experience. Think about maybe the most beautiful place that you can ever live. Some of you thinking about the mountains. Some of you thinking about the beach with a fancy ma mansion. Think about the where you want and, and, uh, and who you want it to live with and how it would look. Do you know that this, the place that God is preparing for you will be a billion times better than any scenario you can come up in your head on this earth? If you know Jesus, the, and the best place, the best thing is not even going to be the place. See, that's going to be beautiful. It's going to be Jesus that's in that place. The psalmist continues to shed light on the nature of God's work in the first part of verse 7. He praises God for his, for his works that displays his faithfulness and justice. Look at the first part of verse 7. The works of his hands are faithful and just. So as we examine the works of God in Scripture, we see that his works show his faithfulness and dependability. And as we saw, reveals that his, that, that his covenants are unbreakable with us. There, his, his, the, we see the trustworthiness of his words, but also here we see the acts of his, towards his people are faithful. Now, it's, it's not like Israel was like a, some godly people, right? Was Israel the perfect people? Absolutely not. They were griping, they were complaining, they were sinful people, but yet God faithfully worked on their behalf. He remained faithful. Listen, we are not much better than the people of Israel. We fail God often. Even this morning, some of us have failed God, right? Throughout the week, we're going to fail God. But yet, aren't you glad, can't we praise God together that we serve a faithful God that is faithful to us even when we are unfaithful? Can we praise a God who, uh, uh, who is patient and kind and pursues us even when we don't want to be pursued? We can praise his name, that he loves us enough that he pursues us and his kindness and his goodness follow us wherever we go even when we don't deserve it at all. This is who our God is and this is who we can collectively praise this morning. But the works of God also display his justice. He's a just king that rules and reigns in equity. God sets the standards of justice. He is a God who fights, uh, uh, fights for and upholds 
Justice for the oppressed, the vulnerable, the widow, the fatherless, the foreigner. He feeds the hungry. He sets the captives free. He punishes the wicked. There is no respecter of persons with God. If you're here today and you got money, status, respect, guess what? You will be judged in the same way those who have no money or respect or power. We all face the same judge. God is not just just in his punishment, but his works of compassion and mercy are an outflow of his justice. One scholar calls it compassionate justice. Isaiah 30 says that, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore he will rise up and show you compassion, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are, those, are all who wait for him. Zechariah 7, 9 says, This is what the Lord Almighty said. Listen to this. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Psalm 140, verse 12. I know the Lord will, remain, will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. Again, this is the compassionate aspect of God's justice. Church, the psalmist is just, is just on a roll here, right? He's in his bag, as people say, and he further unpacks the works of our God that we should be praising him for. Next part, we see that we must praise God because he, before his instructions, um, are trustworthy. His word is trustworthy. Look at the next part of 7 and uh, verse 8. Sorry about my voice here. All his precepts, that's his words, his instructions are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. So all his instructions are trustworthy because he is trustworthy. His words are established forever. We know this, right? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will what? How about this one? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall what? Never pass away. Everything God says will happen and is coming to pass. Everything God says is true. You can depend on it and take it to the bank and put your life on the truthfulness, reliability, and permanence of God's word. There's not many things I bet my life on. Um, even on the flip side, if I got a, you know, if I was betting my life and if I was right, I got a million dollars. I still, there's still, I would give much thought, even if I was very sure. If somebody said, hey, high school football team places the Kansas City Chiefs, all right? And they said, hey, if they win, you get a million dollars. If they lose, you die. I don't know if I would take that bet when I put my life on the line, all right? Even if they said, hey, if two plus two, plus two if it equals four, you know, if that's true, you get a million dollars. If it's, if it's false, you know, you die. I would, man, I would think about this, you know. <laughs> like, if once my life is on the line, it changes the game of what I think is fact. I'm not trying to be pie, extra pious here, but I just know this for my soul to be true, that I could sleep like a baby and put my life on my line if I'm depending on the, the truthfulness of God's word. I know with my whole, there's nothing more true than, than um, Jesus saves. There's nothing more true than when he says that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I can bank my life on that and sleep like a baby. There's nothing I'm more convinced of that Jesus is a Savior, and when you come to him, he will in no one uh, uh, cast out. You can bank on the trustworthiness of his word. When he says, come to me, all you who are, who are tired and heavy burden, and I will give you rest, guess what? He means it. When he says nothing, not nakedness, not tribulation, not the enemy can separate you from the love of God, guess what? It's trustworthy. He means it. When he says he will provide all your needs through Christ Jesus, he means it. When he says he is making all things new and every sickness and death and injustice will be wiped away and there's going to be a perfect uh, environment where we celebrate Jesus together forever, he means it. When he says he is near to the brokenhearted, and some of you know what it means to be sad and crushed and depressed, and he says he's near to you to the brokenhearted, and he's very present in a time of trouble. Guess what? Our God means it. It. Do you believe that he means it when he says what he says? Do you, does that encourage your heart? When he says that he's a God of all comfort, he means it. You can depend your life on the trustworthiness of God's word, and with the psalmist, we must praise him for it. The greatness 
of his work is most significantly highlighted in verse, four, verse 9 to us. We must praise God for his eternal redemption. So the psalmist here has in mind redemption from the oppressors of Egypt, the Passover lamb, protecting God's people from the angels of death, and being delivered from the Red Sea. And see, imagine seeing the whole army just, you walk over dry land, you turn around, this powerful army is just collapsed, right? And that's a powerful thing, that's a powerful redemption. But a greater d deliverance is what Jesus has done for us. As New Testament gospel, gospel people, we see this word redemption and have a, full, a more fuller, glorious meaning of it. We have been beneficiaries of a greater exodus, a greater Passover. Jesus was the perfect and final Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us on the cross. He delivered us not, just, not from temporal, physical bondage, but from eternal bondage of sin and punishment in the lake of fire. The greatest, most majestic, compassionate work of God is his work of Christ's redemption of us, all right, in his death and resurrection for us. All the things that we talk about about the work of God, the, his, his, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the faithfulness of God, the justice of God, the holiness of God, finds its fullest expression in Jesus' gospel work on the cross for us. Church, the greatest work we must praise God for every day is our salvation, the work of redemption, that we were lost and now we're found, death unto life, slavery to freedom, enemies to family, all because of Jesus' awesome work for us. Let me ask you, I know we're running time, but this is so important, have you received, I'm talking to young, old, whoever in here, all right? Have you received the blessing of God's greatest work of redemption on your behalf? We all know that Jesus died for us. Everybody with me? This is the most important part of the sermon. We all know that Jesus died for the world. He died for you. That's a fact. But are you living with the reality that what he did for you actually applies to you? Have you actually benefited from the cross, from the work of redemption. You don't just benefit because Jesus did it. People, Jesus died for the whole world, and yet people are dying and going to hell every day. We say, how is that? Jesus died for everybody, but people are going to hell? People haven't been redeemed? Guess what? You actually have to receive God's redemption through faith, through repentance of your sin. Jesus died for your sin. That means you have to admit that you're a sinner, ask God for forgiveness for your sin, and call unto him to save you. The Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, seen, shall be saved. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God. Listen, this morning, you have to receive Jesus by repentance and faith in him to be a child of God. Some of you think you're a child of God because you go to church or you believe in God. The devil knows they're their God and they tremble. And my, my, my scare is that there are some people in this room that might die and go to hell because they, just, they didn't want people to, to think they weren't a Christian. Brothers and sisters... Jesus wants to save you. Don't let pride and not wanting people to think I'm not a Christian keep you from the salvation of God. The greatest work of redemption has been done for you, but all you have to do is receive it and believe it. Don't die in your sins because of pride. Receive the salvation of God. If, you five, if you're 55, do not let pride blind you and send you to hell. God loves you. He died for you. He, did. he poured his love for you on the cross. He was butchered on the cross for you. Receive the redemption of God. Some of you come here week after week or every sporadically, and you leave, and you just listen, and you leave. And maybe we don't see you for another five months. And I'm concerned for your soul. Trust Jesus. Put your faith in him. Do not allow another sermon to pass, and you just kind of go with the flow. Now is the day of salvation. Trust in the work of redemption. I did not plan on spending that time on that, but I felt I needed to do it. Trust in him. Lastly here, we must respond to the mighty and compassionate works of the Lord in holy reverence. And I move really quickly here. Look at verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
and all those who practice it have a good understanding. His praises, his praises endures forever. When we really study and meditate on the awesome, majestic, powerful, gracious, and merciful works of God, the most logical thing for you to do is fear him, is to reverence him. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and, and instruction. Ecclesiastes, the wise man in the whole Bible, says this, the end, of the, ma end of the matter, it's the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear is not talking about just tim some timidity or being afraid to approach God as his child. The fear of God includes a fear of his judgment and acts of discipline, but it's much more than that. Real fear and loving, holy reverence for God, person and works, means that you are in awe of his works of greatness, of kindness, and all of who God is, and that makes you want to approach him. This is what Psalm 25, 14. Some people don't stress a, fear, a, a true fear of God should, should make you approach God, to want to be around God. Look at uh, 1 25, 4, uh, Psalm 25, 14. You don't have to go there, but it says this. The friendship of the Lord. Listen, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. Meaning, if you fear the Lord rightly, you are a friend of God. Right? There's no closer friend than Jesus, than the Lord. And he makes his, his covenant known to him. Church. The, one of the natural responses to who God is is to fear him, and we fear him by obeying him, taking him seriously. Some of you, you, know, some of you young ones, and some of us talk about we love Jesus, we believe in God, but our life is a testament of us doing what we want to do, of us disobeying the Lord, of us doing what's right in our own eyes. The wicked have no fear of God in their eyes, so they do what they want. And some of us who say we love Jesus and believe in God do what we want, and that shows that we do not fear, the, we don't have a holy reverence for the Lord. The rise and proper response to the mighty and compassionate works of God is walk in holy reverence of him. And the psalmist rightly ends the psalm as he began with the exclamation of praise to the Lord. To him belong eternal praise, the NFI puts it. Do you know that we will never stop praising our God? Never. In eternity, like I said earlier, God is right now saving a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And in glory, we will get to serve God and worship him and praise him without the effects of sin, without distraction, with our full heart. Man, do you look forward to that day? I mean, think of, sometimes we get an experience of praising God that, you know, part of praising God does include emotion, and we are we're glad when we have that experience on this earth. But imagine having that full emotion and connectivity while you're praising God forever in a perfect body. Man, I look forward to that day. I hope you as well. We must passionately praise and fear our God for his majestic and compassionate works. Can we do that together this morning, this week? together.